Hey. Yes. Good. Welcome to the South Orange Library Special Conversations Program. Um, I'm Laura Sims, the moderator for the series. And today I'm so excited to have with us Camille Guthrie, who is a dear friend and also an incredibly brilliant poet. And she has a new uh, book out called Diamonds that you should rush out to buy. Um, or I think we're going to have it in our collection soon. So if you're local, you can get it at South Orange Library. But it's it's so good. It's amazing. It's like one of my favorite books that I read this year. And I really don't read poetry anymore. <laughs> even when I was, this is terrible to say, but I, even when I was still writing poetry, I was not reading a lot of poetry, but um, I totally adore this book. I think it is just on fire. And so do a lot of other people. Um, What's the name so of it? Oh, it's called Diamonds. Sorry, Agnes, I forgot. Oh, oh the, Diamonds. The audio, Diamonds. Diamonds, yes. Okay. Um, there's a Rihanna song by the same name that <laughs> mm, okay. mentioned okay. in the book, right? Don't you mention that in the book? Yeah. Um, so Camille will be reading from and talking about this book, Diamonds, which is just or recently okay. out from BOA Editions. Um, two of the poems... Okay from this collection have gone viral online. And a recent review in the Harvard Review said, these poems don't offer the escapist entertainment so readily available everywhere, but instead that rare thing for which we turn to poetry in particular, making a heaven of hell. I had, so I adore these books, as I told you. Oh, I wanted also to read a little bit from this latest review in the Boston Globe, which came out what yesterday, Camille? Um, and no. it's no, two, two days. Ago. I don't know. I don't even know. I don't know anything anymore. Okay. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> Recent review that said these are rye poems, ones that move with heated blood and blistering vitality, wanting and alive. And I totally agree. I think these are funny, raw, painfully honest, historically elusive, and full of wisdom. Um, so Camille is also all of those things. Um, she is the author of three previous poetry books and her poems have appeared in Boston Review, the Iowa Review, the New Republic, and in those Best of American Poetry anthologies from um, 2019 and 2020. She's received fellowships from McDowell and the Yaddo Foundation. And she is the director of the undergraduate writing initiatives at Bennington College and lives in rural Vermont with her two children, which you will hear about that life in, uh, in the poems and in our conversation. So I think she's going to read a bit and we'll kind of, you know, she'll read and we'll talk and, and stuff. And then you can ask, and you can ask questions whenever, Camille. Sure. That, oh, yes, yeah. yes, yes. So if you put something in the chat, I'll try to read it out. Or if you want to just interrupt, that's fine too. So take it away, Camille. Well, thank you so much, Laura. That was a lovely introduction. I'm flattered and um, I'm a bit beside myself to be uh, doing this event with you because you know, Laura, you're one of my dearest friends and yeah. I'm overjoyed to see my student, Lucci here. I can't stop beaming. So cool. And um, and I see some friends here, Kieran and Lynn. Um, so nice that you came. Um, we're all back to being um, isolated again. So this is just so so fun. Thank you for inviting me to this series for your wonderful library. Um, of course, we're so excited to have you. Thank you. Um, so. Um, 13 years ago, I moved from Brooklyn to rural Vermont, and I was pregnant with my second child. And it was uh, my parents um, drove me up, and um, it was 20 degrees below zero. <laughs> and I moved to the um, faculty housing on, in, at Bennington College, and I didn't know anyone. And um, I had a lot to learn about country life and um, Vermont and um, 
And within a few years, um, my marriage ended and I went through a divorce and a midlife crisis, which I did not expect at all. And um, I also fell in love. So all of these dramatic things happened and this book, Diamonds, came out of that time. And I wrote, I wrote these poems before the previous administration and the world pandemic. So, um, so they're, they're, about feel, they're about a lot of feelings. <laughs> um, so I'll begin with wise woman. One thing I found when I moved here was that I thought I was uh, alone, but I wasn't. I was surrounded by these wonderful new friends and there were several very wise women um, there seem to be a lot of them in Vermont um, who appeared to me and would say incredibly kind things that jolted me out of my sadness and helped me rebuild my life. So this is my first poem is called Wise Woman. Wise women of Vermont come out of the forest. Assure me I won't die lonely in these woods. Show me how to keep owls out of my hair. Tell me how to stack wood, to shoot trespassers, to seal the cracks in my heart, to keep the ice out. Promise me a catamount won't think I'm food. Make me a pot of venison stew while you describe what to expect during the changes. When you no longer sleep and my sorrow seems girlish, Teach me how to trim my whiskers when I get witchy. Advise me which mushrooms won't kill us quickly. Suggest stapling my son to the wall till he's 26. Tell me of your childless aunt who died asking for her kids. How do I make it in this cold, hard land? Tell me, where is the treasure buried? What's the song I have to sing to myself? Beautiful. I love that last line so much. <laughs> so great how it, I mean, how you move from like taking in this external advice to understanding that really you have to take care of yourself. Right? Yes. I was listening to a lot of Kate Bush at that this time, oh. that time, this time too. And um, I kept hearing singing in my head and I finally realized, oh, that's me. Like I, <laughs> I have, there are poems in there. I have to write these things down. Um, she, Kate Bush helped me, she always helps me. But there, there are lots of, all of the things I said in here are things that happened in Vermont. Um, some of you know that a catamount is a mountain lion and when you move here, you start hearing all these tales about mountain lion sightings. And I mean, people assure me that they don't live around here anymore, but um, I was pretty nervous about it coming from Brooklyn. And um, there was apparently a sighting where I lived. You know, I lived on 17 acres with a pond. I was by myself, it was a bit intimidating. And, and someone told me, well, just don't act like food. <laughs> You'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! <laughs> How do you do that? <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. How do I do that? And they said, I... "Well, don't lie down and act like food." <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Wow, that's that's amazing. Yeah. Mm. And so you yes. <laughs> so it helped you to have like or to feel at least that you weren't alone, right? Out in this new wilderness where you found yourself because yeah. i think one of the things about moving from a place like brooklyn is you have these easy contacts with you know girlfriends and friends and you know and and so to move outside of the city is intimidating just for that alone yes it did it did seem to be at first you know um you know like a, a friendly neighbor would shoot deer on my land and then show up with fresh venison so you know things that didn't that didn't happen in brooklyn um, <laughs> but then you know then i made friends you know i made friends who had a pig farm and and i made all sorts of friends one of my uh, dear local friends is here right now 
um, uh, Kieran, who teaches at Williams College, and, and I found all sorts of people who were um, transplants like me, and um, cool. I agreed to love it. That's awesome. Great. Should I read another one? Yeah, please do. Okay. So one of my coping strategies at this time was to tell myself to, you know, stop, um, stop thinking about myself and, um, and to, to understand that my situation certainly could, it could be worse. And this is a children's book, some of you may know by James Stevenson called um, Could Be Worse. That is totally charming. And um, one of the things that occurred to me was the pun that you know, having a midlife crisis in the Middle Ages would be a lot worse than having a midlife crisis now. Um, so that's where this poem came from. During the Middle Ages. Uh. Oh God, I am so fat. I cry all the time. A kitten scrubbed with a toothbrush on line makes me sob. I'm so heartless. Seven species of bees are now endangered and I didn't do a thing didn't even send any money to anybody doing any good. And I can't lose weight, I skipped yoga. I'm so hot all the time, so broke, so pathetic, no wise investments. Should have bought a 7-Eleven on a busy corner when I was seven or 11. Nobody wants to lift my neck. Nobody wants to hold my hand at the doctor's office. Nobody to grow old with me, I'm so crabby. To pluck my beard, feed the cat I don't have and read me endless Russian novels at night. All the ones I still haven't got to, so greatly depressing. Where are you handsome? Are you driving in your car to come visit me, bringing a bottle of wine and a present so gallant? A new translation of Akhmatova, I love it. No? Well, I guess it's better than living in the real Middle Ages when some shithead priest threatens you with hell to pocket your last coin. And there's no Tylenol, so you have to suck on some skullcap seeds. And knights canter about knocking you down to take your maidenhood with pointy lances and who have to work as a midwife with no birthing tub. Nobody washes their hands or votes. Nobody knows about DNA or PMS or NASA. There's nothing to read if you can read except boring doctrine, doctrines or spiritual exercises by Gertrude the Great. I'm not kidding. Yes, there's Dante, Chaucer and some sagas but it's not like you'd get near those books. You'd be lucky to have some jerk recite the latest by Wolfstan the Cantor by campfire right before he beheads your uncles and forces you to rub salve on his abs. <laughs> you know you'd be sweating in a wheat field at 22, dying from your 10th pregnancy by the bailiff. Courtly love, not a lot of it, I bet. Some local doctor would have to drill a hole in my head to let the demons out because I'd be full of black bile plus heresy as I am today. It would be an awfully hard time when the sun revolves around the earth and kings are unbelievably selfish. The Roman empire fell flat, Vikings disemboweled your cousins, and the Lord of the Manor thinks you're cute. And it'll be a very long time before pop art and meerkat videos and cotton candy and sexting and fish tacos and girl bands. Everything's just so bad and you have boobos. Hopefully I'd get shoved into a nunnery to have an ecstatic experience with mystical Jesus. Or better yet, I could be a hardcore samurai laying down justice on the heads of corrupt lords. But that was tough work, dirty work. You're working for nobility who at any period in history are the worst people in the world. And to be an unemployed ronin had to bite. Sunday afternoons, no mom around to make you soup. Even if all the brothel ladies want to scrub your back, 
Sometimes you just want a nice nap and some Neosporin on your wounds. Ah, if I could only be like the divine Seishon again, resplendent in silks with seven layered sleeves, writing in my room about politics, gossip, my lovers, listing splendid, awkward, annoying things, things that make one's heart beat faster, I wish. Okay, I could be her devoted servant, tidying her papers and fluffing her pillow, but even she found many hateful things like about living in the Middle Ages, like crying babies, messy guests, and mansplainers, so irritating, even way back then, you better shut up and take your medicine. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, I love uh, that one. Good and feeling. <laughs> it definitely puts things in perspective, which is what mm -hmm. you you know we're going for, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And did you have to do a lot of research to to fill this out, or did you know? Do you know a lot of this? I know you teach authors from the Middle Ages, and probably know a lot of this offhand. But I I limited myself to do very little research because I would I get too interested in in the research, so um, I didn't want to overdo it. Um, I wanted it to sound just like. Uh, you know, I was improvised, improvising, just talking out loud. Yeah. Um, so I wanted the references to, you know, it didn't matter if you knew if Wolfstan the Cantor was real or not, you know, that right. um, that it just sounds like some, you know, some nut from the, the <laughs> Middle Ages, um, you know, but some things are, you know, um, true admiration. Like I love Seishon against the pillow book yeah. and you know, in it, she, she does say, and this is a, the 11th century, you know, she says, a man who has nothing in particular to recommend him discusses all sorts of subjects at random as though he knew everything. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so <laughs> prescient. Yeah. <laughs> or just not prescient, actually, just, oh my God. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it does have this wonderful feel to it, this conversational feel, which usually in a historical poem, you just, it doesn't happen. <laughs> it doesn't, it feels heavy. Yes. And, and this feels really buoyant and natural, which is one of the many things I love about these poems. Oh, thank you. You know, yeah. they're like, <laughs> sorry, did somebody else was someone else jumping in? You can if you want. I think that was me. That was you. Okay. I was just going to say, um, no, no, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> There's the Middle Ages for you. Um, well, but, you know, yeah, um, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, you know, when we, when we think about the past, I mean, a, a lot of times, it's, at least for me, because I'm not a historian, I think it's a, it's a, you know, a, a fiction of the past, of history. And, um, you know, there's that, that joke about imagining who you would be in a before life, right? And it's always mm -hmm. someone really fabulous, you know? Right. Um, and th that's what I was thinking, you know, what, what is it like to be a woman in, in history? And um, what is it like now? And what is it like in the past? And, um, it would be awesome to be an, an incredible author, um, but, you know. Or a samurai, a samurai you know. right. um, although maybe it wasn't so glamorous being a samurai. I don't think so. I think it was a very yeah. job, it's yeah. a dangerous job. Yeah. Um, so, and, and humor is, of course, comforting when, when you're suffering at a, on any scale, I think. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I love how you move from the, I mean, the, that first line, oh God, I am so fat. And from the personal to the universal very quickly in the poem. And it does really feel like this kind of self-soothing, you know, like the it could be worse mentality, but not in a, um, I don't know, not in a gratuitous or, I don't know, not in an icky way somehow. Good, it, icky yeah. would be bad. <laughs> 
<laughs> it feels like so relatable, so relatable. Well, you know, um, during that time, I was uh, telling myself all these um, sad things that I was un unlovable. You know, things were things were over, and um, and the poems were a way to um, to you know remake my sense of of self yeah. and yeah. Um, um, yes. So, um, I, yeah, I'd imagine it's like a way of recapturing power too, right? Was to write these poems. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And I may be thinking of that because I just read this article in the New York Times about Britney Spears during her conservatorship. She like used dance as this means oh. of regaining yeah. her power like that was the one thing she had yeah. and so I don't know it's like this nice this nice parallel you know you were able to channel a lot of what you were going through into these poems and also wrest power from them I mean these are powerful poems well thank you and um, and you know and, and like for any writer you you know you can't um you you, you choose your content, but your you know the the form of it ends up being what is ultimately um, interesting to you. And um, and you know when I was writing these poems, I I, I wanted to make them like dramatic monologues. So um, so I think like um, this that poem and the title poem Diamonds, which which I will read. Um, um, excuse me, my computer just did something kind of annoying. So. I, let me let me quit something. Um, we're a way also to to write about feelings, but also to make it more performative. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, they feel very performative. Yeah, great. Did you want to read diamonds too? It's a lovely. Sure. Is that what you were planning to read next? You can do something sure. else. Okay. Yes, sure. Uh, diamonds. Um, I wrote this, this is a longer poem. I, I wrote thinking about Robert Browning, the Victorian poet is a poet I love. And um, he wrote a lot of dramatic monologues. And um, so I wanted this to sound as if someone was making a speech. Diamonds. Judith Butler, I am calling you out here in the kitchen where I'm unloading the dishwasher performing my gender as I want to do. My son yells from upstairs, how do you spell probably? My daughter plays a game on my phone, caring for a little green monster who needs a bath. I need to buy diamonds so her monster can sing. I need a sack of diamonds so I can work part-time and take care of my kids and still eat when I'm old, performing my old lady tasks. I hope I'm yarn bombing an embassy somewhere. Better start learning to knit or whatever. Knitting performs femininity, apparently. We need diamonds to afford my house now that I'm a single mom, conflict-free ones for a conflict-free life. To perform a single mom's gender is to need a chest of gold coins. And my life is easy. I am not hungry, not beaten up, working three jobs, taking night classes, not ill without insurance. I have a good job. I'm already leveled up, got all my privileges. I'm not floating on a raft to escape war, not having sex with soldiers for food. My children are not digging for diamonds. We're not being exploited in any way. Could be worse is a book we love to read at bedtime, it's by James Stevenson. It is my son and I think the plot to most movies. It is, I think, the plot to most lives. I'm lucky I get to teach you, Judith, to students who eat up your words like candy hearts, who return to the arms of their friends to dye their hair blue and fuck everyone and not shave, who do drugs and sleep late and dance naked and make manifestos and tweet witty protests. They seem so unafraid, a historical, dreamful. They stand outside the library smoking cigarettes as if we're not going to die, as if there aren't books to read. 
I have the greatest job in the world could be a lot worse. But I'm lonely, in debt, there's no one to love me. I'm feeling sorry for myself and guilty for all my luck. Mutually contradictory states of mind. That's what Shakespeare invented, supposedly. Gender, you say, is a performance, continually created through citational repetition, daily rituals we put on again and then again, as if we were born into a theatrical family, putting on the same play that's been going on forever, and there's no way out, so says Foucault. Michel, my turtleneck darling, I love you. Although you make me feel imprisoned, docile, and subject to self-surveillance. Judith, Michel, I'm calling on you. I think I'm stuck in Hamlet, in the rule of Queen Gertrude, but not at all royal. I'm from Pittsburgh. Because if I mention any man's name, my son says, I hate that guy. I asked him if he thought I was pretty. He said, eh, you're okay to good. For his birthday, he'd like a BB gun. My daughter spins in the living room to Rihanna, who has a pile of diamonds, probably. This little Ophelia talks to her Legos and swims with water wings. She wants to know if music is air. She says my butt jiggles when I walk. Yes, that's it. I am a single Gertrude in a little New England hamlet. Yet there are no louche kings to marry, no murderous uncles available nearby. Yet in the porches of my ear has poured the wish, the poison of the wish for reliable love. Marriage is a prison, then is the whole world one. What I want is someone, not a husband, to perform the male gender around my house. I need help stacking wood, putting the garden to bed. For the winter, I need a man in my bed. It goes way below zero in the winter round here. The garage door is broken. I don't know how to fix it. Better learn to fix stuff, I guess. Like Gertrude, I am the interpreter of the men around me as I put snacks into little plastic bags and so disciplined plan another play date. I play the assuager. I'm afraid of being left with nothing for my future no castle, no bolt hole on this dirty planet. No extra small bag of gems. I have unappreciated skills, it's true. I know how to do a close reading. I know where commas go. I can spot fellow geocentrism miles away. In my cat glasses, I'm laying it down. Yes, I'm terribly lonely, Judith. Less lonely than Ophelia floating downstream, clutching flowers and singing sad songs. I want someone to perform love on me, any kind of love, any kind of role, I don't care. But I want the real thing, real love, to be a prisoner of love, the songs say, and to perform all the sex acts too. I want a masterful performance of that with repeat performances, who's there? I am sitting here folding laundry on the couch, performing the pairing of the socks in anxiety and pleasure, you say. In the porches of my other ear pours the poison of the wish for diamonds, could be worse. My daughter spins her own tornado, my son builds a house of diamond blocks. I want the curtains to part now. I want to be swept away. Mm. Lovely. <clears throat> very good, very good, very nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so speaking of performance, so you were just talking about performance and performance is such a huge part of this poem. Could you talk a little bit about like the performance of gender and 
the role that Shakespeare has in the in the poem as well? Yes, the poem is, I think, about, you know, a lot of things, but it's it's about teaching. Mm -hmm. And um, my first full time job, I taught at a, a private Quaker high school and I taught Hamlet for five years in a row. And I, I don't think I've ever studied as hard uh, any any text before. And it's such a it's, you know, like obviously one of those deep texts that every time you read it, you learn something new about yourself and life and, and everything. And and when I first taught it, I, I was a I was um, in my late twenties and I related to Hamlet, of course, and um, and Ophelia. You know, I was very interested in feminist readings of Ophelia's rule and but as a middle-aged woman, I suddenly understood Queen Gertrude in a, a whole new way. And um, as a political person and a mother. So, so the poem is, a lot of it is about being a teacher and, and a writer and, and, and living through texts mm -hmm. throughout different times in, in your life. And, um, and, Moby Dick is one of those texts for me and, and certain poems and, and Hamlet and, and at Bennington I was teaching, often teaching Judith Butler and Michel Foucault and, and Butler of course very famously talks about gender as a performance and how um, we, we construct gender by daily citational repetition, right? By these daily rituals that we, we do every day and um, performing our gender or, or, you know, questioning our gender roles. And um, so that was something I was, I was thinking about in this midlife crisis and as a mother and um, a, a feminist and a professor, and mm -hmm. how I had um, taken on roles and needed to question them again. Mm -hmm. um, but formally, in terms of performance, I, I wanted the poem to sound like a, like a monologue. Mm -hmm. And so that the challenge was, how do I do that? Um, how do I keep it together? You know, um, mm -hmm. and, and one way I do that is with the adverbs, like when I say apparently and supposedly, right. those little, <clears throat> little bits of glue that hold the poem together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's amazing too how you switch registers very, and this is true for all the poems, but I really notice it in this one, just like from the high to the low and back again, you know, there's Judith Butler one second and the next, you know, you need money and you need to unload the dishwasher. And I feel like that's something you do really beautifully in these poems. Is that something that you feel like you've always done in your work or is it something that you kind of came to in these poems? Like I, I think it, it, I came to them in, in this book. Um, mm -hmm. the, the book is very different than my previous books, and I wanted it to reflect more of my actual life. Um, mm -hmm. My previous books were more conceptual, mm -hmm. and um, you know, this is uh, for those for those of us here who are um, uh, right uh, teaching and um, parenting, or or you know, involved in our families. This is. This, you know, this is very much my life. I'd go in and teach a class on Judith Butler and then pick up my kids and, and they were playing Minecraft and having these phone games in which I'd have to spend all this money to buy gems, you know, so, so the game would be fun and, you know, um, do all these household tasks. But meanwhile, you know, I'm thinking about all of these, these other things. Um, so I, I wanted it to reflect all of those things at once since we do live in high and low culture I you know I don't even know if that we have these if those are valid distinctions yeah distinctions anymore you right. know Rihanna is a great artist as is you know um Shakespeare and Judith Butler right right yeah you certainly like intermingle them very convincingly here you don't feel the distinctions yes yes mm -hmm. does and anyone have sorry go ahead well, the poetic apostrophe is so much fun to play with, right? To call out um, the the people you want to speak to, especially when you feel lonely. And and you know, apostrophe is often used in poems when someone is is gone, it has died, or 
or their relationship is over. And I think right. to apostrophize, you know, um, Judith Butler and, and you know, and, and, and say Sean again, and it's a way of, you know, talking to the, um, the writers that, that I, that I adore mm -hmm. and, 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 and being in conversation with their ideas. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's not, I don't know that it's a terribly used form, um, contemporarily, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're using a pretty traditional form. Yeah to write a, a pretty non-traditional poem and and very compelling and yeah. And did you use other, were you using other forms throughout the book? Were there other forms that you played with? I know you were thinking of reading Serious Moonlight. Yes, right? um, some of them are sonnets and um, there's right. a Sistina and there's a list poem and- Oh yeah. Um, um, I would be happy to read that poem, but I see a, a, a question from Karen. Oh, hi. Oh, good. I'm glad you noticed. Hi, Karen. Hi. Um, uh, the mention of sonnet um, reminded me when you said Browning, for a moment, I wasn't sure which Browning you meant. Um, and so Robert Browning, of course, is the famous one with the dramatic monologue. But when you were talking to Judith Butler and there was... Um, there was a yearning and um, and a wistfulness and a frustration as well as an assertion of power. I was reminded very much of Elizabeth Barrett Browning's sonnets, yeah, um, sonnets from the Portuguese that are much more than just lovey dovey, oh, yeah. um, oh, oh, Robert, oh, Robert kinds of things. <laughs> and so I thought that sort of that that move to power and the address of one force that is a construction was. I thought that was a really another really nice connection we're thinking about that or whether that ties into the sonnets that you're talking about in the rest of the book but I really I thought that was a great connection also oh thank you yes I um I love her sonnets and um and it's so interesting when she you know she they moved to Italy and her and you know politics come into her sonnets and um they're such a fascinating couple um I was just reading a biography about them and there was this moment where they had a caper and, and they had this this more modern friend and she and her friend were going to dress up as men and go out on the street. But if they were caught, they would be arrested. <laughs> wow. I know, it's such a great moment. It should be, a we should write a screenplay about the Brownings. Um, but- um, yeah, Why hasn't someone done that? That's surprising. We're gonna oh, do good. it, Laura. We're gonna- Okay. Do it. All yeah. right, next project. Yeah, just don't don't give her short shrift. No, oh, I wouldn't. No. Especially and Aurora Lee is really very political and feminist too. That's a, yes. that's a great move on her it's part. A, yeah, I agree with you. It's a, an amazing poem. Yes. I'm not sure why she gets um sentimentalized. It's that Victorian thing. People assume that Victorians are all sentimental. Mm women, Victorian women poets. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> you really haven't read Emily Dickinson. <laughs> is, that, is that Lily, my former student? Yes, Lily, it is, hi. Camille. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. It's wonderful to see you. So wonderful to see you. I just wanted to say before we moved on how um, I remember reading your poem, Diamonds, and I was still at Bennington, and just how I, I, how emotional I get every time I hear that because I really, and you know, I see Lucia nodding. It's, you know, at Bennington, I just, you know, you along with several other professors, um, it, I had such a such a connection and. Um, there's such a growth that I feel like all the students have at Bennington. It's a very special and unique place. And um, I just, I got choked up even hearing you say it again. And I'm glad to see your face. And um, I'm trying to plan to return to Bennington to finish my degree. So hopefully I will see you soon. <laughs> oh, I hope you do. Thank you yeah. so much for telling me that. And um, please, please email me. 
I and will. I will. I can help, you know, help you upon your return. I, I'm yeah. thinking, right, as you're talking, I'm thinking about all your work is, oh. all of, and your artwork is, is coming through my mind. Thank so you. thank you for telling me that. Yeah, so lovely to see you and hear you. Thank you. It's lovely to see you too and Lucia. Yeah. I've been very touched and yeah. we'd love to see you again. It, um, the one of funny thing that happens about this poem is that students tell me they're like, were you writing about me smoking outside of the library? <laughs> <laughs> like, no, I wasn't writing about anyone specific. <laughs> my office is in the library and it's right over where the students all smoke and um, I don't really like the smoke. <laughs> <laughs> you never smoked as a college student? Oh no, I never did anything bad. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> One and of my dear friends is here, I, whom I went to college with. Um, really? I'm Who is that? Touched. It's Donna Stonesafer. Oh, uh, hi, Donna. Yes. I can't see. I can't see everybody, but that's great. So I, I don't mean to call her out, but I just want to say that. I also have <laughs> many out. college call memories with my beloved friend, the brilliant poet Donna. Oh. Don't say <laughs> um, and do you think that teaching has been a big influence on your poetry in general? Like oh either the yes. yeah. Sorry. Oh ahead. yes. I mean, so many poems from this book are about. Um, po um, things that I've taught, like there's a poem, there's a poem about Milton and um, so many, so many of the poems are about reading, you know, and um, thinking in Plato and, you know, right. texts that uh, HD, Lucci and I read HD together, just, you know, texts that, that I adore and, yeah. and read all the time. And how do you balance, I know it can be tricky to balance teaching and, you know, devoting yourself to students and, and to preparing and reading with creative work. So how do you manage that? I know that's something that everybody who's here, who's a writer struggles with in some form or other. So how do you, how do you deal with it? I don't know a lot that I balance it. You know, I don't. I don't know if anyone ever feels like, okay, I've balanced all Got that, it. right? Yeah. Like everything is yeah. harmonious now. Um, I, I, I think I just do the obvious things that we all do. Is that 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 I'm incredibly stubborn and disciplined. So when I do have time, I I sit down and I work and I and. And the older I get, the more I try to just sit down for 15 minutes or an hour and mm -hmm. put in some time on something, even if I, if we, even if I'm totally frustrated with it or um, I, I'm not sure what, where I'm going with it. Um, and I find that over time, the work accrues. Mm -hmm. um, but this book, you know, was written mostly done before in 2016. And, you know, it took me two years to find a, a publisher and it took two years to come out. And, you know, so um, writing, it takes a lot of patience and uh, yeah. devotion. Yeah, it does. Um, yeah. But I, I don't, I don't, I don't ever feel like, oh, yes, you know, I've got it. Figured yeah. it out. <laughs> I guess, yeah, what you're saying about sitting down for short increments, I think that was something I did not get until I was in my 30s. And I think actually when my son was born and I realized the only time that I have during the day is this 20 minutes while he, like right. this is my time. So I am going to use it. And since then, I've been able to be like you a lot more a lot more disciplined and like, okay, I've got 15 minutes. I'm going to use it. I'm not going to waste it. Um, yes. and I feel that that sometimes comes with age or like, you know, your circumstances changing. Yes. And I think also if you have the chance to, you know, um, I, I didn't apply to writer's colonies until, um, my younger 
daughter was five, I somehow thought I couldn't leave her. Mm -hmm. And um, and when I did, it was like the happiest two weeks <laughs> of my life. Um, it was just awesome. So you know, you know, I think you also need to to assert that sometimes you're allowed to take a break from your, if you can, your responsibilities. And um, mm -hmm. and um, it, it, it was just a, a, a marvelous time. Yeah. Did you write any of the poems here at Writers Colonies? I'm sure you did. I wrote almost all of these poems. Really? Draft. Yes. Yeah. Um, it was my first colony. I, I went to Yada, which is was only an hour from my house. So I actually went back to a world away. My kids. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's nice. That's nice. Yeah. 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 You know. Um, right. But um, should I read one more poem? Yes, yeah, please okay. do. Okay. Um, since uh, Lucy and Lily are here, I'll read my HD poem. And um, because the women modernist poets are the greatest. Oh, they really are. They are. So um, this poem is called Come Back. It's another apostrophe. Come back. Hey, HD, come back. There's trouble all over. Ruins, as you said, there as here. I need your flowering vision, lady. Come with your angels and blank book, with your elegant cheekbones, your loquent lines, upswept white hair, lyrical long fingers, and dark wool cape as I'm reading the news. Help us. We filled the oceans with the plastic crap we like to buy. Choked the sea nymphs, let loose toxins into the sky. The land is parched. The poles are melting. My friends are canning food and buying guns. I have serious doubts. I have two children. You had one, Perdita, the lost one. We live in the country and drank water poisoned by a chemical factory nearby so people could eat microwave popcorn and make omelets with nonstick pans. It's not that bad. Our blood levels are so-so. It's my job to protect them, HD, from bullies, traffickers, warmongers. I will write down everything you say. When bombs fell around your family, you seem so sure in your poems walking down a London street, thinking of Egypt, of Mary, of ruins. You stepped through a broken wall to see a bomb blackened apple tree flowering. It guided you through the blitz. Here, when cherry blossoms appear after the winter, I think pretty pink ladies don't catch a disease and die on us. I remember the two towers falling, people pulverized into clouds of dust. We breathed in their particles, a sickly sweet smell smoldering for months. That week, the skies bore a blue clarity. What can you teach me now? I don't think the petitions I'm signing are helping. Not religious, have no husband, need advice. Where to now, HD? Come near if you can bear it. I know it's not exactly here as there. We have made our own problems. Aloud, I read your poems, and there you stand at the top of the stair, holding your book. Your cape falls over me. HD, tell me what to do. Lovely. So why, why HD in particular? Oh, uh, well, you know, she wrote, um, she wrote her, her, the poems trilogy that make up the trilogy um, during World War II when she and her wife Briar decided to stay in London during the Blitz. And they had, Briar was a millionaire, so they could have left, you know, they could have escaped and they decided to stay. And um, an HD is, was a visionary poet and, um, and I, I just fell in love with her. I was introduced to her when I was in college at Vassar. And, um, and I, I, I always think about her in times of um, political crisis. And um, I was living in New York City when the Twin Towers were hit. And, um, and now we're in several, 
several um, crises, obviously the climate crisis and the pandemic and so on. And um, I, I guess it's, it, it's, the poem is an apostrophe to her to ask her, you know, for, um, for wisdom, another wise woman. Um, and one's own problems are often very small in comparison to these larger um, problems, but um, we are living through them at the same time, right? We have our, our small concerns, but we have all of these overwhelming concerns in our, and the question of what can we do about it, right? Mm -hmm. How can we survive it, but also what can we do to help others and, um, mm. and love our families um, and make meaning out of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she's someone I think figured it out in a way. Yeah. In her poems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're figuring it out too in these poems. <laughs> I'm, tr I'm trying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're Making, all trying, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, does we have a few minutes? I just wanted to open it up to any other questions. If you have questions for Camille, it can be about the poems, it can be about the writing life, whatever. Anyone? You can just speak up or do the little hand thing. Donna, Donna. <laughs> or I, I, I was still in my pajamas. When you <laughs> me. I'm not quite camera ready. So um, I want to know what's next. I'm so excited for your next poems and, and book. So can you tell us anything about that? Oh, Donna, just hearing your voice makes me cry. <laughs> um, what's next? Well, um, Donna, you well know Donna and Laura are the people I send all my drafts to and have to read them all. So um, I've been working on a novel for a long time and I don't know if I'll ever finish it, um, but that's one thing I'm, I'm working on. And I, I want to finish it this month. I don't know, we, we will see. And, you will. Um, you will. I will. Okay. Yeah. You and, will. <laughs> and uh, I want to finish it before the term begins, right? So, so again, like, how do how do you balance everything? Well, you just do it when you have the time. And um, I I do want to write some new poems, um, maybe in response to Sappho. And um, it's I like to think about somebody else when I'm writing and. Um, and also about living in Vermont, living here changes you. And I, and I feel like I've been still a city person for 13 years. I'm still, you know, thinking like, hey, the winter is way too long here. And this is wrong. You know, <laughs> when is this going to improve? <laughs> and um, and I, I think I need to look more closely at what is going on around me and um, trying to do that. Like, look at, like, look at the way the the modernists tell us to look at things as they are. They are. We, they want, we want them to be. Um, so I, maybe some kind of my style nature poems coming. Oh, I like mixing. Mixed with Sappho? No, I think the Sappho would be love poems. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Are you yeah. teaching Sappho? Um, a student is doing an independent study on Sappho. So I get a chance to reread some Sappho. Lovely. Great. Anyone else? Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Donna. <laughs> Thank you both. <laughs> this is exciting. I didn't know about the Sappho project. So I know I didn't either. <laughs> You've been hiding that from us. Now I have to do it. <laughs> now, you, now you really have to do it. This is even recorded, so we have proof. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Nature poems, Sappho poems. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, if it, nobody has a question right now, I would you mind reading like just another short poem? Sure. Yeah. Yes. I we, have, we still have a few minutes. We have four minutes. Plenty okay. of time. All right. Why don't I read um, the sonnet? Um, series Moonlight. Yeah, I love that one. So this is a poem I wrote um, after David Bowie died. And um, 
I also wrote it, uh, it's also a nature poem. Um, in the, the first house I, I lived in, in Vermont, it was on a hill and it overlooked farmlands um, which went up into the Green Mountains. And at night there would only be one light in the distance. So I could see for miles, but just one light. And when there was a full moon, the moon was an event. Like it, it was, moonlight was so bright and so beautiful. And um, it, I, and so when Bowie died, I thought his line from his song, Last Dance, uh, Serious Moonlight was just a perfect way to describe that kind of moonlight. Mm. Serious Moonlight. Serious moonlight fell brightly on the mountains tonight. Elegant moonlight fell loudly on the deer asleep in the yard. Broken moonlight fell splendidly on the swing set. Moody moonlight fell hard on the weedy pond. Pretty moonlight fell recklessly on the garden beds. Cruel moonlight fell on the car parked in the driveway. Fierce moonlight fell thoughtlessly on the recycling bins. Actual moonlight fell wildly on the coyotes falling on a rabbit. Personal moonlight fell intentionally on my desk and books. Ancient moonlight fell perfectly on the bed sheets. Modern moonlight fell roughly scattering my thoughts. Bowie died last night. His exquisite alien soul has taken off. You are with another and I'm falling repeatedly shattered by the silently falling terrible moonlight. Ready. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. That's beautiful. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Camille. Thank you. Nice um, to meet you. It was yeah. nice listening to your poems. Good. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I, I, you're, you're welcome. I just wanted to say, I, I never think of these poems as having been finished like in 2016. That's so weird because it feels like 10 centuries have elapsed since 2016. But at yeah. the same time, <laughs> these poems feel like so perfect for this moment. Um, it's really amazing how that happens. Um, and yeah. Thank you for letting us spend time with them. They're extraordinary. Thank you, Laura. Extraordinary you for me. I'm, I'm a little you. biased, but I still, <laughs> <laughs> they are extraordinary. Um, thank you so much. Well, thank you. And thank you to everyone who came. I'm yeah. so touched to see some friends and meet new people and to see my former students. And Laura, thank you so much. You know, I love you. It's yeah. so lovely to talk thank to you. you. Thank you. And thank before you. we sign off, thank I just want to say a last thank you to Camille and to remind people that our next program is January 21st, same time, same place on Zoom. And our speaker will be thank Professor you. Shelley Eversley, who will also be helping us launch Black History Month at the library a few days early. She is the Interim Professor of Black and Latinx Studies at Baruch College, and she's going to give a talk on the surveillance and censorship of Black authors and artists during the Cold War. It should be fascinating. So please join us. And I just want to read you the chats. Everyone says, thank you. Just bought the book. Thank you, dearest. Luciana says, thank you, dearest Camille. You're the best. And yes. Okay, thank you guys so much for joining. Okay. And Camille. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank oh. you, and have a happy and healthy year. And good thank luck you. to you. Thank you. <laughs> happy okay. New Year, everyone. Stay safe. Stay Bye. well. Thank you.